Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get back in our Father's Word. Book of Mark, chapter 6. You're going to find out why many people are discouraged about teaching or planting seeds in this particular chapter today. But the reason is given, and it's pretty clear, and it holds true even to this day. Chapter 6, a word of wisdom from our Father, verse 1 reads, and he went out from thence, and he came into his own country, that'd be Galilee, and his disciples followed him. Got the whole crew right along. Verse 2, and when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, from whence hath this man these things questioned? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? I mean, they'd seen him grow up. He was, he was originally the carpenter's son, and now he's the carpenter because Joseph is gone. <clears throat> They're going to call him the, the carpenter. But... A, a person in his own environment, usually that's a bad place to plant seeds. It, it is quite simple. They simply do not understand uh, how that one of their own could be blessed by the living God and be given knowledge and wisdom to be able to understand the Word of God. So many times when you're planting seeds in your own family, you'll be discouraged. But don't be. That's nature. It's natural. Now, Mary herself, the mother of the Lord, inasmuch as he had at 12 years old, and we just finished a chapter where 12 became quite obvious, a woman had an issue for 12 years, and a 12-year-old damsel was asleep. They thought she was dead. And he raised her back to life, giving life and healing. But here, when he was 12 years old, another indicator, he was downtown Jerusalem mixing it up with the big, I mean, scholars from downtown. And even they were amazed when he was 12 years old. But then, you shouldn't be. Why? He was the Word in flesh. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So, naturally, the wisdom came from God because he was Emmanuel, God with us. But the people didn't know that. They were, I mean, in the, in the daily life of, uh, of, um, uh, of things continue as is over and over, day after day. Verse 3, is not this the carpenter? Notice, not the carpenter's son now, but the carpenter. The son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judah and Simon. And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. They, the word offended means they, they stumbled at it. Because they knew him as an individual. And, you know, let's just get it right down where the rubber meets the road. When, when, um, and I'm referring to ourselves now, not the Lord Jesus Christ. But when, when you grow up with a group of people, they know that your socks get dirty just like everybody else's. And it's pretty hard for them to put stock into some great information you might have. Because they know you inside and out. And that makes it very difficult. Uh, sad as it is, and a truth is a truth, and a fact is a fact, regardless of who it is or where it comes from, if it can be proven. But it doesn't count when you're among your own. Christ will teach that here. 
And if it happened to him, it's certainly going to happen to you. Verse 4, And Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. He's, he's not going to find anything there that will impress people, even with the great miracles he was performing. Verse 5, And he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk, and healed them. Now, after the, after the prior chapter, let me ask you a question. Why could he not do a mighty work there? Because even though he had the capability, he's not going to provide a mighty work unless there is faith present. Without faith, there's, there's nothing going to happen. And I'm going to say that again. Without people of faith, he's not going to do anything. And that will carry over even to this day. When people are praying for a healing, if you have people of, uh, that have no faith in, in, uh, in attendance, you've got trouble. Because God will not deal with, with people who do not have faith in the truth and the facts of life that Christ presents. Uh, he simply will not perform or, or a request. So uh, many times that's the reason. Um, this is the reason like even an anointing. I, I could not even begin to tell you how many thousands of people I have anointed at their request. But I have never anointed someone that did not ask for it. Because when they ask, that documents faith. Because without faith, your works are dead. It's not going to help. And you're wasting your time and theirs if faith is not present. So this is why, and I want to bring that up because of how well faith in the last chapter was carried forth in the woman with the issue 12 years. I mean, she spent every dime she had on doctors, and they couldn't help her one iota. He touched, she touched just his garment. And presto, her faith made it possible. Therefore, it's important to know. There was a few that were really sick, and he could spot that faith, and he touched them. Verse 6, and he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went round about the village teaching. This did not stop him from teaching. But he was still, um, whether they would receive it or not, the truth is always there. You see, who then is at fault? He's certainly not, because he passed on the truth whether they would receive it or not. So the guilt then falls on their head, not his. Seven. And he called unto him the twelve, his disciples, and he began to send them forth by two and two, and he gave them power over unclean spirits. This is why he could drive those unclean spirits into the swine instead of sending them back where they came from because he, gave, he gives us authority to drive out unclean spirits, period. Uh, your documentation for that especially is uh, Luke uh, chapter 10, verses 18 through 19 and following. He, he gives you that authority over all your enemies. But there's a little catch to that. If you have the faith, if you believe. Verse 8, And he commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey, save a staff only. It's rough walking, and that means a, a walking stick for, for protection. No scrip, no bread, no money in their purse. This word scrip is a very interesting um, word. It means a begging bag. You will not take a begging bag because my disciples will not beg for money. You won't take any with you either. But if you're following me and you have faith in me, you won't have to. That being the point. So 
uh, the script was what they would give um, uh, a begging boy to go out and, and beg among people. He did not want, why would he send them two by two? For witnesses, to witness for each other. Verse 9, but be shod with sandals and not put on two coats. Don't, you don't have to take a, enough gear to camp out for six months. Just travel light, what is necessary. 10, and he said unto them, in what place soever ye enter into an house, there abide till ye depart from that place. In other words, if a house received you, let your peace fall on it. You see, any time you were traveling, a traveling minister, priest, as they would be, there's quite a ritual in putting on a special meal and the special greetings and this. It takes a lot of time. So he said, don't change houses where you have to go through this every day. But stay in the same house because the ritual, once it's done, then you can get out there and get to work, get back and be restful to go the next morning. Verse 11. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you, when you depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. When you have to leave a city, that's a, a sad state of affairs for them, for even above perversion, they're going to have the worst sin. And that's kind of a shame, isn't it? But what, would, what does this kicking the dust off your feet mean? Well, what was in the street at this time? There was camels and cattle and dung, and that's what you kicked on the city. You stirred up, the, you made it very obvious that you were um, through with them. You know, so many people feel they must have a seed planted and then it grow, just can't leave it alone. I'm going to force them to receive the truth. You're wasting your time. You see, there is no way a human being can make a seed grow. Only God can through the sun. You plant the seed, but he's the one that gives the germination to the little embryo in the mind and causes that seed to grow, you don't, okay? So that's the, it's no big deal when somebody, don't, don't waste your time casting your pearls before swine. If they won't receive it, so be it, that's it. They'll, the truth will still be embedded in certain minds and time will come when it will spring forth if God so wills, 12. And they went out and preached that men should repent. What? Repent of your sins. Okay. Verse 13. And they cast out many devils, not just a few, many, and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. You know, this is something that is a fallacy of Christians today. It is amazing to me how many Christians will say, anoint, anoint with what? The, how, how sad it is and what a reflection that is on teachers of God's Word in this world today. I never heard of a Christian anointing, anointing, anointing. And you want to be real careful because you'll be showing your ignorance. For what does the word Christos, that is to say Christ, mean? It means the anointed one. He was anointed, anointed by Almighty God, for he was Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, and the etymology of his very name comes from as rubbing with anointing oil, the anointed one. That's Messiah, the one to come. Well, then, does the oil do the healing? No, it doesn't. It doesn't do it at all. But it is your obedience to Almighty God to anoint with the oil, then asking Him for the blessing, and whether it be healing or whatever. That is very much a part of a Christian act. And it is, it is, uh, it is ordered by God Himself through James chapter 5 that that anointing is very much a Christian thing. 
And uh, any a Christian pastor that does not have a veil of, oil, of olive oil, well, what does olive mean? It's Eliyah. That's the sacred name of the living God. That's what the olive tree, how, that's how it is pronounced in the Hebrew tongue. Verse 14. And King Herod heard of him, for his name was spread abroad, and he said, John the Baptist is risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. Now, Herod had married his brother's daughter, uh, wife, rather, and that, that was a no-no, and John told him so. But Herod loved to hear John teach. He really did. He loved to hear that word. Verse 15. Others said that it is Elias. It's, it's old Elijah. And others said that it is a prophet, or as one of the prophets. They, they were trying to understand our Lord and Savior and the mighty works that were being done. 16, and when Herod heard thereof, he said, it is John whom I beheaded. He is risen from the dead. Herod hated this. I mean, he was guilty of sin over having had John beheaded. It was not his wish at all. He was, um, his um, faults, um, tricked him into the act. Verse 17, For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias, uh, that's his sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. A no, no. For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Verse 19, therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him. She hated John the Baptist and would have killed him, but she could not, meaning she, she didn't have the, um, the horsepower she, uh, at, at all to get it done, but she sure had a grudge against him. Verse 20, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and an holy, and observed him. And, and um, when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. He, he loved to hear old John teach. And, and again, guilt lies at the door here. 21. And when a convenient day was come that Herod on his birthday made a supper to his lords, high captains and chief estates of Galilee. I mean, he threw a drunk that wouldn't quit. I mean, it was party time, and the stuff was flowing. 22, and when the daughter of the Herodias came in and danced, oh, so lonely could dance, and pleased Herod and them that sat with him, and the king said unto the damsel, Ask of me whatsoever thou wilt, and I will give it thee. He was taken with his own stepdaughter, and, um, but he was drunk. He might learn many lessons from this. 23, and he swear unto her, Whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it thee unto the half of my kingdom. Oh, ho, ho, generous. And he said this right in front of his high chiefs and the government officials and every muckety duck that he had under him. 24, <clears throat> and she went forth and said unto her mother, what shall I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. That's what Herodias said, 25. And she came in straightway, right away, with haste unto the king, and asked, saying, I will that thou give me by and by, which means right away, in a charger the head of John the Baptist. Uh-oh. 26, and the king was exceedingly sorry, yet for his oath's sake and for their sakes, which sat with him, he would not reject her. In other words, the king can't go back on his word. <clears throat> and in his drunken stupor, he gave that authority. 
Verse 27, and immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought and he went and beheaded him in the prison, 28, and brought his head in a charger and gave it to the damsel, and the damsel gave it to her mother. What a gift. What kind of people are these? You have many people in this world, and you have to know how they think and how they operate, and you have to look at facts. <clears throat> you cannot, excuse me, you cannot be persuaded by political correctness to make void moral justice or moral correctness. As a Christian, you can never allow that. Christianity will never offend anyone that loves God. And if people don't love him, we don't care what they think. Okay. We're certainly not going to be captivated by them or allow them to rule over us. That's not going to happen. So here, this is what this can get you into. And so it was, what a gift. The head of John the Baptist. That one that God himself would say in Luke chapter one, verse 16 and 17 would be born and would he come in the spirit of Elijah if they would have received him. Well, you've got the story right here. They didn't receive him. They beheaded him. Therefore, Elijah is yet to come as soon as the second advent must transpire because they did not receive Christ either. They crucified him. So now, as God would have it, there will be a second advent, and it will transpire. But then God knew that long ago when Psalms 22 was given a thousand years before the crucifixion, it speaks of Christ being nailed to the cross in his final words. Verse 29, and when his disciples heard of it, they came and took up his corpse and laid it in a tomb. And, uh, and so it was that uh, this one served. He prepared the way for the true Messiah at the first advent. Verse 30, and the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. In other words, those that he sent out, they're coming back home now. And um, certainly, uh, would, would no doubt were successful, as you'll find out, 31. And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart unto a desert place, and rest a while. I, I mean, it, for there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. It, it, was, it was busy, busy, busy. They could get no rest because people wanted the healing. They wanted the touch. They, they wanted the truth, and they were starved for it. And Christ said, let's get us a little distance out here where you can have rest. 32, and they departed into a desert place by ship privately. Tried to slip away. Going across the lake and we'll be over there by ourselves. 33, and the people saw them departing. And many knew him. They recognized him. And ran afoot thither out of all cities and out went them and came together unto him. They beat him all the way around the lake and were waiting on the other side. Verse 34, and Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were as sheep, not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things because he was the shepherd. He was the chief shepherd. They were his sheep. They knew him and they, they longed for that teaching and it was enough. They had, they had proven, number one, they had the faith because they ran around. They had faith to know he could heal. Not necessarily saying they had faith in him as the son of God, but they had faith in him knowing he could cut it. I mean, he didn't have, he had proved it over and over. Verse 35, and when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, this is a desert place. 
and now the time is far past. Night's coming on. There's nothing out here. No quick trips. No way to feed these people. 36. Send them away that they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves bread for they have nothing to eat. They ran around here. They were not prepared. They're, they're, they're ill-equipped. And it's getting late. Send them away. Verse 37, he answered and he said unto them, Give ye them to eat. Now, you must realize to the Christian there's many ways to feed people. The most valuable food you can give someone is truth, the blessings of God from on high. But here we have an example. There will be a divine intervention and this is Christ feeding the multitude. He always has plenty. And that's what this emphasizes. Um, Give them to eat, and they say unto him, Shall we go and buy 200 pennies worth of bread and give them to eat? This, this would be about 40 bucks at that time, which was quite a bit. 38. And he said unto them, How many loaves have you? Go and see. Check it out here. And when they knew, they said, five and two fishes. We have five loaves, and we have two fishes, two fish. Now, naturally, loaves is the bread of life, and Christ's body is that bread of life. And the word fish is symbolic of Christianity. Do you know why? Because of its spelling in the Greek, iota. Chi, uh, theta, epsilon, 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 and sigma, which when you're spelling fish in the Greek tongue with the Greek alphabet, and what it means being interpreted to cipher it is Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. That's why that when even today when you do documentaries out in high mountains, you will always see the sign of a fish above Babylonian or Babel writings. The Christian always takes the high ground and leaves that fish, um, which is to say, iota, chi, theta, upsilon, sigma, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. And so it is. That's what it means. And here, five is the number of grace. And here you have that grace, and, the, and he who could, dis, to, could um, um, expound that that he had, and he did. 39, and he commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass. This would be uh, verse 40, and they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. Perfect order. Uh, you don't, a mob, a mob, uh, Shouting, yelling, and a mob doesn't cut it. Okay. This is done with reverence. And it's done in order. Not just a, a bunch of mobs grabbing at bread and, and fish scraps. Done in order. That's the way Christ operates. Verse 41. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and he blessed and break the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them and the two fish divided he among them all. Now let me ask you a question. Did Christ feed the multitude? The answer is no he didn't. Christ did not feed the multitude. He had the multitude to sit down in order in 50s. And then Christ asked the blessing on what they had and gave it to the disciples, and the disciples did the feeding. That's what he expects today, is that his, a disciple is a pupil or a student of the Word of God. And in a sense, all scholars or st 
still students of the Word, for you are ever learning why the Word is pregnant. It grows. The understanding keeps, it continues to come. Thank God for that. And it is the Holy Spirit that enables us to, to utilize that ability to reach forth and gain new knowledge. But here, he breaks, blesses, and distributes to the disciples, and they do the feeding, which is what you're supposed to do today in planting seeds. It's a good chapter. Don't be disappointed, especially if it's among your own. Learn from the Savior and do it his way, and do not be discouraged. And uh, verse 42, and they did all eat and were filled. I mean, do you know how many people were there? Well, let's read it, 43. And they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments and of the fish. 12 baskets. In other words, after the feeding to the multitude, there was still a basket for each tribe of the house of Israel. Always enough to go around. There's enough spiritual food for everyone. There's always room for one more. And, and you, you can, that is the beauty of Christianity. There's always room for one more in the love of Almighty God. If they believe and if they have the faith. Uh, there's a great deal to these fragments. There is also a danger among those fragments. You must, to give you a good clue, when you have had a multitude of people, there's always going to be a bunch of fragments. Fragments. You're always going to have some would-be, not students of God's Word, but of their own selves. And they're going to try to lead away people that can be beguiled into false teaching away from the Word of God. And that's what will happen with these fragments. We'll pick it up in the next lecture. You don't want to miss it. Our Father is in control. Our Father blesses those that have faith. Our Father blesses those that believe what? His Word and are able to absorb it into their very soul and being and be blessed by him. He always feeds, and he feeds well. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? Ezra and Nehemiah. These two books are necessary to understand the returning to the Father in that sense of the example set forth in the end times of the rebuilding of God's most favorite place on earth. Also, within these two books, you find the hidden secret, hidden from most people's eyes, that the study in the Hebrew and the Chaldee that is given in these particular books will teach you how that the priesthood itself became polluted during this period of time. This is to say about 400 years before Christ walked the earth to the time that he did walk instructing you very wisely, setting the example of how it is that we gather back to Christ himself. Ezra and Nehemiah, fantastic. You'll enjoy them. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We do not judge people. We have one judge, our Heavenly Father, and he does not need our help in that. You do have the uh, proper authority to discern spiritually who you should listen to and who you should not listen to. How to, to bring a sweet savor forth for Almighty God where he will be well pleased and bring blessings on you and those around you. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. It's always a pleasure. You got a prayer request, you don't have to have that number, you don't need an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. Right now, he does. You don't have to pray out loud even. He's a mind reader, he reads your mind. 
This is why no one can ever, ever prevent you from praying, whether you're in class of any kind or in any place. Because you don't have to pray out loud and no one can even tell except our Heavenly Father. And boy, it makes his day when you let him know you love him. So let's go to his throne. Father, around the globe we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. And question time. Alma from, um, I believe that's Alabama. Thank you, Pastor Murray, for your, and your staff. Well, thank you. It, will the earth be restored before or after the millennium? After the millennium. The millennium um, must take place, that thousand years, and as soon as it's over, then it is written in Le Revelation 21 that we have a new earth, but the correct translation is we have a rejuvenated earth, same old earth, but a different age, a different time, and a renewing of, of putting this uh, erets, this terra firma, back in its original uh, place. Sharon from Alabama. Does God listen to sinners' prayers? Of course he does. He will hear them. doesn't mean he will answer them. He answers everything to his will. That's why you always want to pray in his will. I know there are certain teachers will tell you it is weak to just ask in his will. It's stupid to, ask, to not ask his will. Because if you love him and trust him, he knows what's good for you. He knows how to bless you. And you may want something he doesn't want you to have. If you love him and have faith in him, then that automatically makes you not want it too. So you just say, thank you, Father. And, and um, sometimes he may even break the paddle out a little bit, kiss it, and thank him still yet. You've got to know, you've got to love him and trust him. That's what faith is, is um, obeying him. Now, naturally, as you read in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4, all souls belong to God. It does not say all non-sinning souls belong to God. And it does not say all sinners belong to God. It simply is all-inclusive every human being, their soul belongs to God. So naturally, in as much as you are his, he hears you. But he will only answer you when you follow the word. What is the first thing? A sinner. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Don't, don't know that and understand it coming out the gate. A lot of people think once they're saved, they're perfect. And they live in a dream world. <clears throat> because one must repent as long as they walk this earth. You're going to fall short. It may be in food. It may be in uh, no telling what. But we're, we're, there's none of us perfect. And we are all human beings. But God does hear the sinner's prayer. Okay? Regardless of what some preacher might say. <clears throat> Excuse me. Jeannie from Florida. I've been studying with you for six years. I study and pray daily, but I don't feel saved. I need some help. I don't understand. I have no joy. Uh, Jeannie, I, I'm probably going to do a no-no here. I, this past weekend, I did a, uh, I did a work called um, Sweet Saver. I think it's what you need, and you, you wait until it, it will play on television after the third Sunday, probably on the Thursday of this month. So you set your clock for it, okay? It's titled Sweet Savor. I think you'll enjoy it. Diane from North Carolina. Do you go through the whole Bible on these shows, both the Old Testament and the New? I find your show very intriguing. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm glad you do. Uh, it's the Word of God that's intriguing, and, um, and uh, certainly um, he sees to it that uh, it's interesting, because he makes it interesting if you're in tune and have faith. We, we do cover the entire Word of God, for it is his Word. Uh, Woodley from California, 
Can a man still read the Bible if he is taking medic medicine? Of course he can. You know, um, Luke was a medical doctor. He was a physician. And he was, he was uh, wrote one of the most complete gospels of the four. I mean, he really got specific. He was probably the better educated of the four uh, to be able to convey thought. And certainly, um, uh, legal, God, you know, there are many Christian doctors and many of them, you might be surprised, even before surgery, they will pray. And a family should pray also. But we have good Christian doctors, and, and God gave us medicines. A large part of them come from natural things. And, um, and natural things um, will, um, is what medicines many times are made from. And certainly, that's a good thing. Um, and, and so it is. Uh, nothing wrong with taking prescribed medicine for illnesses in this uh, polluted world. Um, Lenora from California. I love your ministry. Well, thank you. We love having you. What are unicorns, and what does it mean in the Bible? What did they look like? Thank you. Well. You know, if you've ever seen a picture of a wild ox, that's exactly what they look like. There's no such thing as a unicorn. That's Greek mythology. Uh, the word in the Hebrew manuscripts is wild ox. How it ever got to be translated unicorn is beyond me. Or there is no such thing. And I, I find it very disturbing that even in one of the greatest Psalms written is the Psalms of crucifixion. That is to say, Psalms 22, Christ's words on the cross, that they even use the word unicorn one time in that 22nd chapter of Psalms. And that's real sad because it should be wild ox. Very plain, very clear, and straightforward. Okay, and we got James from Georgia. What, why do you change the word fear to revere? Please comment. Thank you. Well, the Hebrew word is yara. Okay. And what does yara translate? Let's don't just transliterate it. It has two meanings. It means fear and revere. And when God wants your love, is rather than translating it fear, because God doesn't hold people by fear. So in as much as yara means both fear and revere, a student doesn't, you don't have to be um, um, necessarily the sharpest uh, uh, light in the, in, in the uh, chandelier to know and understand that, um, that uh, God wants your love. Naturally, if you're going to go out here and do something extremely wrong, then you better translate it fear, because you certainly have something to fear. The same emotion runs both ways. It is, it is not surprising that yara has dual meanings. Many Hebrew words have dual meanings. That's why that you need to analyze in the original languages more so when you have a problem with something and then you will have a better understanding. David from Minnesota. Is there a connection between angels and Nephilim? Well, well, they're both angels. But there is no connection because usually angels are good. Nephilim are fallen angels. It comes from the prime in Hebrew, nafa, which means fallen. But, well, how did they fall? Well. Rather than being born of woman, they were taken by woman and came to earth to seduce her, not to be born of woman. And this, was, this would wreck God's plan of each person being born innocent of woman. If an evil angel came to the earth, with full knowledge of what happened in the overthrow and so forth, 
God wanted innocency whereby a person without uh, any qualm, qualms made up their own mind whether they would love Satan or love God, period. And therefore, uh, the Nephilim, the fallen ones, are in chains, as you read in the great book of Jude, for destruction. That's the penalty of having left their place of habitation, heaven. Uh, jo Joyce um, from, uh, and Jack from Arkansas, thank you for your teaching the true word of the Bible. I have never heard it taught this way by any pastor, and I've heard quite a few. I tried on my own over two years. Every day I read the Bible front to back. The third time I started all over again, I still couldn't get it. Finally, I started praying. And that took a while, too. I don't have enough paper to go through all of it, so I'll make it short. My husband found you on a certain channel in June of uh, 2010. And this has been, we've been watching you every day since, Monday through Friday. I thank God every day for sending you to me. And I should say, I should say this, can you tell me where, tell me what's to happen in December 2012? Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Well, there's one thing you can rest assured of that will happen in December 2012. It's going to get cold. The reason it's going to get cold, it's winter. And that's one thing we can really count on. As far as knowing, uh, many people take the Mayan calendar and predict, yep, it ends and, because what? They ran out of rock. But if you really know how to read the Mayan calendar, it starts over again, different cycles, okay? But um, we, we know we're very close to the end and we're watchmen and we're supposed to watch. And that's the most important thing. Uh, Carol from Canada. I do enjoy watching and learning from your daily program. This will be my second letter written to you and asking questions. Thank you for your answer. You are welcome. What ages will babies be born, children, to be in heaven if they happen to have died in the womb or just after being born, full grown, young? What, what does the Bible say? You know, it's, it's real easy to read. When, when it describes an angel, what does it always say? It says a young person. Okay. Why? Because angels don't age. And in our spiritual bodies, we do not age. God created all souls and spiritual bodies at the same time. You can kind of pick up on this, and one of the places would be uh, the great uh, wisdom speaking in Proverbs chapter 8. But they're full grown, always. And we recognize loved ones. Is it okay to donate body parts before or after death if you um, help others in great need? Of course, giving sight to someone, that is precious, okay? I, I don't see anything wrong with it. Um, I, do, I do feel like I would never want, like sometimes people have the heart, lungs, and the whole bit transplanted. I, I think I would be ready to go home to the Father instead of wanting to get a whole, I, I mean, to, um, the heart, lungs, and the whole smash, okay? I, 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 I'm kind of, that's a personal choice. Wait, whatever a person wants to do, there's nothing, there's not a sin written against it, but um, be that as it may. Some people might try to make a sin out of it. Uh, this is from my five-year-old. Please read this on the air so she and others may learn. And, and let me make this out. It says, does, does God build us? This is Abby, age five, from Connecticut. Well, Abby, God does build us. And that word build is a fantastic word. It means he forms us. And he, he forms um, <clears> the <throat> child in completeness. It's born with fingerprints. It's born with a soul. And it's a child of God. And uh, he, does, he does build us. And that, that's a good question. Thank you for asking. 
And here we got uh, a pretty card, and uh, it says, "How do I, how do I do communion at home, my husband and I?" Well, you simply take communion when it's necessary. I like to take communion three times a year. Christ said, "Take it as often as you meet." They always met at Passover, the Pentecost, and Feast of Tabernacles, and. Um, I think that's well, but th there are times you have illnesses and uh, have need for, for um, a, a healing or what have you, communion is good. You just take it at home. You can take it with us by television. We always uh, give television on air, and, but you, you don't need that. Just simply take it at home and know that, that um, the bread is his body. He took the stripes, we get the healing. And the wine is his blood that he shed for our forgiveness of sins. It washes our sins away when we repent and partake of that. Um, when people have a problem uh, of, of the old disease of alcoholism, you can substitute uh, uh, grape juice. Ruth from Minnesota. I would like to know what the number four and nine mean. Well, the number, the number four means the earth. Like everything about the earth, you have four seasons. You have uh, winter, spring, fall, summer, and and um, and uh, fall. And uh, nine is um, divine completion through the Father. Okay. Okay, we have here Margaret from New York. Is it documented in the Bible exactly what the church of Smyrna and Philadelphia teach? Other things are documented in two places. Well, it is documented in two places. It's documented in Revelation chapter 2, verse 9, and Revelation chapter 3, verse 9. And certainly, uh, the truth is documented over and over and over what they taught. The second witness to the fact that those who, that uh, those churches are familiar with those who claim to be our brother Judah, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Christ teaches it in another place in Matthew chapter 13, following verse 35, that after the Catabo, the foundations of the world, the overthrow, that uh, Christ came through the Father, planted the good seed, which is, is God's children, but then an evil one came and planted his seed in the night, the uh, children. That was Satan, the old devil. And there you have it again. Those two churches teach that truth so that people have the key of David that lets them know the difference between the true Christ and the fake that comes first. People that do not know the false Christ comes first are in dire danger of worshiping him thinking he is Christ because that's what he calls himself. But he's a fake. That's why they call him instead of Christ, meaning in the Greek, Antichrist. Christy from Texas. Okay, my name is Christy. I'm 16 years old. I still attend high school as a junior. My dad has been watching your Shepherd's Chapel every day. He tells me always to record your programs so that we may learn the Word of God more and more. Thank you and God bless. My question is, what Bible book do you recommend for my age and any others to help me along the way? Thank you. Well, well um, Christy, I think the one we're in now, because it was written by youth. It was written by somebody that started about the same age you are, and that's Mark. And, and the whole book of Mark, we see it through the eyes of a youth. That's why it's so vivacious and moves so greatly. It's a good place to start. It gives you the life of Christ, the reason he came, and uh, a pretty good touch. And then it is good for you, and you will find out that Mark in the 13th chapter is exactly what a young person needs to know, especially right now, as we approach these coming days. Be sure and don't miss it when we, when we teach it, Mark 13. 
Okay, Rand, 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 Randell from, um, uh, where is Randell from? Let me see if I can pick it up here. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is not a life or death question, but something my friend and I have pondered and would like to know just to satisfy our curiosity. We both like woodworking as a hobby. What exactly is gopher wood? And where is it growing if it is still available today? Well, it, it's really quite simple. It's usually one that has um, resin or pitch. Uh, some people think pine. I think cypress. Okay, it's a cypress. Uh, Regina from Arkansas. If there were no J's in the Hebrew, then how was James and John spelled? Well, James was spelled Yekat. And John was spelled Yon. Okay. Uh, there were no J's, so you, uh, it, their pronunciation will get it for you. Jacob. I know that in English it's Jacob. But the correct pronunciation of the Hebrew word and name is Jacob. Okay, and I'm out of time. Hey, you know what? I love you all because you enjoy studying God's word chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Most of all, God loves you for it. It's the letter he has sent to you to educate you into knowing his wishes for you whereby he can bless you because indeed he does love you. It makes his day when you read the letter that he has sent to you. And when you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God. He will always bless you. You can count on it. Most important, though, you listen good. You stay in his word every day. In his word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, he is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. The Book of Ezekiel. What a fantastic study, this book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel that covers, if you would, those vehicles, those circular discs. In the Hebrew, it states very clearly that that whirlwind with the color amber traced back to the Hebrew, highly polished bronze. What an exciting thing that God's word informs us on all things. Ezekiel one of my favorite prophets of the Bible, probably more written, not probably, but absolutely more written on what will happen in the millennium age than even the book of Revelation. Ezekiel guiding you through it, what God will expect at the final battle, Armageddon and Haman God recorded in this great prophecy. I know you're going to enjoy it, the book of Ezekiel.
Rapid, Arkansas, this is Shepherd's Chapel with Pastor Arnold Murray. Join with us now as Pastor Murray takes you on a book-by-book, chapter-by-chapter, line-by-line study of God's Word. Now, here is Pastor Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Praise God, we've been waiting on you. We're ready to get back in our Father's Word. Back on a discussion again, the discussion of our Father's plan. Now, I want to summarize a little bit because I want it to be real clear in your mind as your Father's intentions. It's important that you know that. Understanding His plan makes the entire Bible very simple for you. That is to say, understanding the order 